Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 315th New Social Environment. I'm Jess Chen, events assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Fong H. Bowie, Klaus Ottman, Raphael Rubinstein, and Eleanor Hartney on Jennifer Bartlett, whose show at Paula Cooper Gallery is up until June 25th. We're also thrilled to have our special projects associate, Malvika Jolly here, who will read a poem to close today's program. We start all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wabinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom in recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions. And now to introduce today's guests and hosts, Artist, writer, and independent curator Fong H. Bowie is publisher and artistic director of the Brooklyn Rail, the River Rail, Rail Editions, and Rail Curatorial Projects. From 2007 to 2010, he served as curatorial advisor at MoMA PS1. Curator, critic, academic, and administrator Dr. Klaus Ottman oversees the curatorial department at the Phillips Collection and leads the museum's University of Maryland Center for Art and Knowledge. In 2013, Ottman curated Jennifer Bartlett, History of the Universe for the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and the Parish Art Museum. And last year, he authored the catalog for an exhibition of the Phillips Collection, Jennifer Bartlett and Pierre Bonnard in and out of the garden. Art critic and poet Raphael Rubinstein is the author of numerous books, including The Afterglow of Minor Pop Masterpieces, 2007, and The Miraculous, 2014. He edited the anthology critical mess, Art Critics on the State of Their Practice, and is widely known for his articles on provisional painting. He's also an editor at large for The Rail. And last but certainly not least, New York-based art critic Eleanor Hartney is the author of numerous books on contemporary art. She is author of several noteworthy books about art, such as Art and Today, Postmodern Heretics, The Catholic Imagination in Contemporary Art, co-author of After the Revolution, Women Who Transformed Contemporary Art, and most recently, Doomsday Dreams, The Apocalyptic Imagination in Contemporary Art. She is an editor at large for The Rail as well. Eleanor, take it away. Okay, very good. All right, um, welcome to ev everyone. Um, and I think we have a very interesting program here today. We're gonna begin um, with each of the um, panelists talking a little bit about their their relationship to the work of Jennifer Bartlett, their it, its impact on them, or basically whatever they would like to say about that. Um, and then we'll be having a conversation and, and finally at the end, a uh, Q&A. So uh, we look forward to hearing your questions. So we're going to begin um, with Raphael Rubenstein. Raphael, take it away. Uh, thanks, Eleanor, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, maybe uh, a way to start, um, considering Jennifer Bartlett, uh, and there's an exhibition of her work up now at Paula Cooper. It's work from, I guess, the mid 2000s, um, early mid 2000s. So it's always great to be able to see, uh, see the work um, that we're talking about. But one of the challenges with um, Bartlett's work is that uh, her, I think her, her most significant pieces are um, rarely seen uh, because of their scale. And I'm thinking uh, uh, mostly about the, the painting Rhapsody, um, the massive painting which is shown, it's so large that it can only be shown uh, in very big spaces and not very often. But I think the one of the reasons why, I think there are like two reasons why Bartlett is really important in the history of art. And, um, and one of them is the challenge she offers to the idea of the um, self-contained painting. And in her work, especially in Rhapsody, which is many hundreds of uh, panels that kind of work through permutations of a system that kind of is 
system systemic and also falls apart. But the her work is always it's like you can never see it complete, it, even if the work is all in one space. It's so the scale is so great. And the way she is always iterating and reiterating and, and going further. And I think that what she did there is she took ideas from conceptual art, artists like Ankawara and Hannah Darboven, the idea of the work as a series, as a sort of all, a constant work in progress, and applied that to painting. And that was one of the things that does is it, it I think it, um, it challenges the idea of the of the sort of self-sufficient masterpiece of the of the autonomy of like a sing the singular work. And I think one of the reasons, I mean, I think Bartlett is very, you know, has been an important recognized artist for a long time, but I think she's not as appreciated by, for better or for worse, by the by the art market, by the world of auctions, by like that, 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 you know, increasingly influential um, uh, force and I think it's partly and I'd love to hear what other people think about this but it's because she does not present like the great masterpiece the single painting she's like she doesn't make trophy art she makes something that is has to be uh you have to basically enter into it it's kind of like the you know it's like a stream it's like Heraclitus's stream that you you know every you in you it's never the same thing twice and so I think that's one of the reasons she's uh important and I think the other one um, is that she challenges the binary of abstraction and figuration. Yeah. And there's a lot to be said about that. Um, and, and she's done that throughout her, um, throughout her career, but she doesn't do it by kind of, you know, in a, she doesn't do it by, in a Richter-esque way of, you know, having two bodies of work, one which is figurative and one which is abstraction. She somehow is able to incorporate uh, both of those modes in the single in within her work, and I think she does this. And this, uh, I'll, the last point I want to make, she does this the the way she finds the um, alternative to the figuration abstraction binary is through uh, approach to a kind of diagrammatic painting, and um, and uh, anyway, I'll leave it there. But for me, those are like those are the reasons. Uh, uh, some of the reasons that I think she's really an important artist. Thanks. And, and we're always showing some of these, the images, particularly Rhapsody and and, and some of the later works that it really it, it kind of generated. It, it, it's a really, it's like an engine in a way of her work. And so we'll be showing some images of that um, after everyone has spoken. Um, so next, um, I guess, Fong, do you want to say a few words? Fong, uh, Fong, are you there? Or we can we can also go to Klaus. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Good. Sorry, a bit late there. Um, thank you so so much for being here. It's a it's an incredible pleasure to share with you some of my insights over the year, having observed her works while I was in college. Really, um, I think that one of the greatest joy in life for some of us or many of us is the complete pleasure of immersion or submersion in reading certain novels that were once made into film also, which get seen in the reverse order, maybe for some of us in any case. For example, I saw David Lean's Lawrence of, of Arabia. You remember starring Peter O'Toole, Alex Guinness and Omar Sharif growing up in Vietnam. Uh, and the same can be said of Job Kilker's Justine with Nurt Boga and um, Anouk and me before reading T.E. Lawrence books on Seven Pillars of Wisdom. And also Lauren Doro's uh, The Alexander, uh, Alexandria Quartet. Uh, those were the two books, two films among many that I remember when I interviewed Jennifer at her home in Brooklyn, we spoke for a good two or three hours before we actually began talking about the work, you know? It was such a pleasure because it was on the occasion of her show at Locks Gallery then. It was published around the same year, 2011. And I remember talking to her as I uh, sharing Borges who once say, I, I have always imagined that paradise will be a kind of a library, you know, or John Didion. 
we tell our story in order to live. You know, the, the, these are some of the proposed condition, I think, that aspires how I think of Jennifer's work. I, I, I think her immense aptitude for reading, telling stories is so essential to, to her own work. You know, this is not to say that her narrative is the usual kind of narrative. It's rather complex in ways that she would deploy different form of procedures that Raphael pointed out that would correspond to what she thinks is a natural progression in her work. In other words, she, she managed to me uh, brilliantly created for her own, um, I would say dialectic yet super flexible structure. You know, a dialectic idea, but it's flexible, you know, that it populates somewhere in between and why have the amazing ability to adapt. You know, in other words, it can extrapolate somewhere between abstraction and, and representation, which I hope we can talk a little bit more later, between the stringent system-based aesthetic of conceptual art, also you just mentioned Raphael, and the unrestrained painterly approach, because that's when I came to New York in the late 80s, the, the immersive New York expressionists, of, you know, which is populated by mostly male painters, you know, which I hope we have a chance to talk about that too. And then finally, between somewhere being static and constant movement, you know, Eleanor, somewhere between that, could we talk about Morandi, we talk about definitely Piero, um, certainly the famous Ubino mm -hmm. panel, you know, flagellation, the great one, which is tiny, you know, in Ubino. Um, and, and we talk about the, the calmness and serenity of nature, which she, she absolutely adore, the garden and, and the flower, the tree and whatnot, as opposed to the loud vitality of urban life, which she also loved so much when she came to New York and so on and so forth. Uh, th these are unique, I think, attributes that she share uh, with her old friend, the late great painter, Elizabeth Murray. Also, I think that's super important to bring Elizabeth in the mix here, which I feel deeply that the love for reading evolved out of that too, because I believe uh, they met undergraduate at Mills College. I mean, basically Jennifer discovered Elizabeth while she was reading Ulysses on the floor and laughing out loud. You know what I mean? And that to say that Jennifer had already read uh, Doro, the, the Alexandria Quartet in high school, not to mention Trollope and Chekhov and Eliot and among others. Jennifer is incredibly well read. I mean, my talk with her can be just about books, you know, nothing else, because it was so rich and I wish I recorded it the whole time. And, but at any rate, I think that that had so much to, to do with her alchemy as a painter, as an artist. Um, and, and for those of you um, who have read the quartet would know that Doro or that, you know, or Doral, Doral had a strong interest in science. I think that's very interesting to me, Eleanor. You know, in science in the sense that as he once said that modern literature offer no unities. So he had to turn to science as a source of, um, of relative proposition, which is the idea of creating three sides of space. You know, in one being of time that constitutes a synthesis of a, a sense of a continuum, because you remember this concept was how the four novel was based. The first three novel, uh, Justine, Balthazar, and Mao Olive tell the same story of the event from different perspectives. You know, and each recontextualize, I think, what actually occur. They each in turn represent the three dimension of space instead of one that would fail to, to, to share uh, the whole story. Why the fourth, the fourth, the final one, uh, uh, Claire, revisit the same character five years later, adding also the additional perspective of time creating that similar continuum. So I think that Jennifer's body of, of lifelong work is being unfolded similarly. You know, mm -hmm. it's very slow. It's exactly what Raphael says, you know, even though Rhapsody is a masterpiece, the rest has never been 
that similar masterpiece, you know, uh, in accumulations, whatnot. But I think that it's being unfolded similarly to this uh, ever complex, enormous onion from which layer upon layer can be revealed, peel away slowly to the viewer in ways that the quartet did, mm -hmm. I think, for, for his reader, you know. Um, so there's a lot to say about um, Jennifer's work. But for now, I think I'm, I end there. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I hope we can get into that, those elements, the, the narrative, the, the literature, and, and also, of course, the cinematic aspects of the work, which are, are I think, very, very important. Um, all right, so next, we'll turn to Klaus. Right. So, um, unfortunately, I was not in this country uh, when, uh, you know, Jennifer started showing her most important early works in the 70s. I was still in Berlin. Um, but I consider Rhapsody, which was shown in 1976 at, at Polo Cooper Gallery, uh, probably one of the most important uh, works of art of the 20th century. Uh, I think it's it's quite unmatched, not just in scale, but also in ambition and uh, in execution. Um, and it's there's a couple of interesting uh, things I'd like to mention. Um, number one is that uh, Rhapsody made Jennifer famous very quickly. It, it was a very successful piece of art. It was sold uh, for quite a substantial amount of money right out of the uh, the exhibition uh, and uh, but uh, she, her career was not straight uh, as one might have expected today um, you know she became very well known she uh, but she had this incredible as everyone has already uh, mentioned this incredible broad uh, uh, interest uh, and she operated not just in a artistic uh, strictly a painterly or uh, artist uh, circle but she operated in many other circles in the literature circle in the film and theater circle in the music circle um, and uh, she left New York she moved to Paris uh, and uh, and also uh, she embrace failure like no uh, few artists that I know have. Uh, she constantly changed her styles. She made many experiments, some more successful than others. Uh, and I think it was uh, a very bold move to do at the time, but I don't think it, uh, it really was very good for, for her career in a way. But retrospectively, you know, it's, it's all very different because all these things that she as a, as a young woman, a successful woman artist did in the 70s and early 80s, um, every, every artist today does the same thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's very common now for artists to, to cross disciplines and to cross all these borders. Um, so, and I did not really, I did not really see Jennifer's work until kind of like the mid 80s. I saw her work at a wonderful exhibition that had great impact on me at Paula Cooper Gallery, I think 85, 86, uh, of the boats and houses, paintings and sculptures of boats and houses. Um, that really um, blew my mind. Uh, and I still love that work. Um, I did not meet her until a few years later, really, uh, uh, in person through Suyan Locks and and uh, and I was very privileged to be able to to work with her on this survey that I did um, much later. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, and I think that kind of relates also to the map paintings. In, in a way, Jennifer's work is could be described as variations on a theme, but also I think one of the most important aspects of her work is the focus on place. I think place is really, really important in her work. And almost her works are, I could just say, variations on place. And uh, um, that began with the uh, address paintings, some of which we will see, uh, and, uh, and then the houses in general. The house became kind of an archetype 
of of kind of the American life for her, and uh, and of course it you know it very much um, deals also with the kind of dialectic of the inside and the outside, <clears throat> uh, and uh, relates therefore to the gardens, mm. and uh, and that's you know and then you know to earth all the series is basically um, houses gardens the sea uh, and then the earth and then from there the maps um, all kind of relates and the whole universe so that's why i called the show the history of the universe and uh, i mentioned in my in my book that there's this uh, kierkegaardian uh, concept of movement in place uh, and it's really another another way for him to talk about this famous um, leap um, which is more of a qualitative not a quantitative leap uh, and so in a way and especially with the garden series uh, you see this movement in place uh, where there's all this variation happening all that movement happening um, but still it's all linked to one singular place so um yeah um I'll, i can talk more later yeah very good well thanks thank you very much well so since we've all been talking so much about rhapsody let's move to the slides now and and we'll kind of talk over them um because i, I agree with what everyone is saying is that i think rhapsody is one of the great masterpieces of 20th century art mm -hmm. and um you know, for those of you who haven't had a chance to see it, it it's it is a thing that has to be experienced in person. Um, I can't remember. I'm sure that I saw it before, so sometime in the kind of must have been in the early '80s. And I, I at that time, maybe when I was, um, I think we're about to have a storm here. Um, when I, I was um, perhaps when I was in Minneapolis, and then I later saw it again, um, of course, at the Museum of Modern Art. But um, the willow tree just crashed. What? The willow tree just crashed. I, I hit okay. my lightning. Okay. okay. I have to call the fire department. Okay. 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 Right? Okay. We're just having kind of an emergency here. Shit. Sure. Um, okay. Um, anyway, but just to quickly do this, and then I'm going to go see what happened to the willow tree. Um, so it, it, it's an amazing, um, it's amazing work. It's a kind of inventory of, of it is, it is sort of a history of everything. It's an inventory of what art can be. And one of the things that actually I, I would like to maybe have Klaus or, or one of the others of you talk about is, you know, let's, the, the context here, it appears in, in 1975, you know, she does this work. Okay, and this is a time, of course, when, um, you know, it, it, it sort of fits in with the conceptual art, you know, kind of modality of the time, but it's also the way that it, it's about how images are created. So it has this sort of figurative aspect as well. And it, blending these two together, um, you know, it, it, again, a, a sort of amazing revolutionary thing to happen at that moment. So uh, maybe Klaus, you could talk a little bit about you know, kind of the context, because, you know, it, it's an amazing thing to see now, but it's also, you know, to think about it appearing at that moment. And maybe we can see, there's a couple more slides here. Um, and I will be right back. Oh. Yeah, and I mean, obviously it, it relates to her earlier, uh, more um, mathematical works of the dots um, based on mathematical uh, equations and all that. And rules, and but but it also kind of was um, was taking it, it was looking forward into other things that she did later. So a lot of what's what what's on these walls is is are things that that she moved into. You know, so it's very um, prophetic almost that that painting, and, and it was just an, an unbelievably you know bold bold thing to do and. Uh, I'll read you what what she what Jennifer said herself uh, about it. Uh, Rhapsody was conceived as a painting that was like a conversation in the sense that you start explaining one thing and then drift off into another subject to explain by analogy and then come back again and include as much as you can so that you are able to follow those elements through separately or look at them in total. I wanted to explore some of the basic elements of painting, break things down into various categories. So it also is basically um, almost the entire history of 
of art, or at least modern art, is in that painting. Uh, she she included all the various styles, uh, you know, impressionism, post impressionism, and and so on, uh, in, into that work. So it's uh, it's really um, it, it was something that that um, you know was really really unique and unmatched at the time. Um, I wanted to say about Rhapsody and, and to pick up on the literary uh, uh, relationships and analogies that Fong talked about, and certainly the Lawrence Durrell's Alexandria Quartet, is um, if that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I thought of another book in addition from about the same time, uh, Raymond Cano's Exercises in Style, which was a book published in 1947, which in which Cano takes a really um, banal incident on a bus in Paris and retells it 99 times in 99 different styles. And this was sort of one of the kind of beginnings of the Ulipo group. But what, uh, what I think that if you look at Rhapsody and in particular, like she takes the most basic, like a, a house, a circle, a square, a like, you know, there's nothing like, there's no kind of grandiose imagery. She's she's she says I can make you know I can I can do everything I want. I can explore everything I want to say with the simplest means. And then she's also uh, I think that Cano was inspired by he said he was inspired by the art of box the art of the few. And somewhere in I think in her conversation with his great conversation in Bomb Magazine with Elizabeth Murray. And something to say about that, but uh, the Bartlett says that Bach was important uh, to her. So the idea of like the musical variation, the you know, painting is a musical variation, and and you need to have that expanse, and and also to give herself that that incredible sense of scale and expanse. And just as a footnote, however, since we're looking at this uh, installation at um, MoMA, which as I said the first time I saw this work, uh, that atrium space is so huge, so massive that, you know, I think it's important to remember when this work was shown at Paula Cooper in the 1970s, it was in a much smaller space and the sense of scale would have been, in, you know, it would have been enveloping. And I, I have to say that I think that sometimes museums have, you know, in their, in their uh, enthusiasm, their like hunger to make big, impressive, uh, monumental spaces, they can serve, they can end up doing injustice to works that were built for much smaller, more intimate spaces, but that's really just a footnote. Um, uh, yeah, we saw that when they installed the water lilies as well, and it suddenly it almost looked like a postage stamp. I know, yes. Um, so um, maybe we uh, move on to the next set of slides. Um, which is so um, here. Okay, I mean, in many ways, um, you know, that it's, I think the germ of all of, of Bartlett's work uh, is in Rhapsody, but then it was, you know, there was a kind of unfolding um, of the ideas that are encapsulated there in, uh, you know, as she continued to think. And maybe, um, Klaus, you want, might want to address the, the next few slides here that we're looking at. Yeah, so, uh, you know, she did this whole series of addresses. These were all, if I remember correctly, addresses of, of people that she knew and, uh, uh, and where they lived. And again, it gave her an opportunity to, you know, to play around with different stylistic innovations. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and she talked about the house, especially and, um, being, as I mentioned earlier, this Kind of almost archetypal structure that, uh, and and of course we should remember she comes from uh, Jennifer is from California, so and uh, and like her her you know her great friend Joan Didion, you know um, she really relates to this kind of suburban kind of life um, archetypal almost uh, or, or typically very very American lifestyle of of the uh, the West and of California, and so. The idea of the pools and the houses and the fences and all this, it's its not so much of a New England thing, it's more like a, you should really think of it more as California. And uh, and also she, uh, I think there's, there's always some 
um, and I think I've written about that, some, some threatening element in there too, just like John Didion, who, who often spoke about um, also the, the threatening aspect of California. It wasn't all just sun and palm trees and, and all this, but there's the earthquakes and, and you never know when something like an earthquake can happen. And so, so there is this living on the edge. And I think, um, I think Jennifer really picked up on that in especially her a late mom, a few years later work um, where there's beauty, but then there's also, also this kind of, kind of um, the edge being at the uh, beauty at the edge of danger and so forth. We can maybe go to the next yeah, slide. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's go on. I don't know who lives at these uh, places. Yeah, and you see again, yeah, these same kinds of motifs here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there you have, you know, the grass, the houses, then later you, you, you get fences and you get pools. Yeah. Okay, we, let's, now I want to say a few things. Yeah, let's go on to the garden because this was, um, mm -hmm. to me, I, I remember seeing this show at Paula Cooper and I think it must have been just after I arrived in New York City. And um, of course this, the, the, the garden, um, it has an interesting backstory. She spent the summer, she, she rented a house in, I think it was in Nice, um, it was as a villa, you know, and she was going to be there for the summer and, and work. And she got there and it was a complete disappointment. And the, the place was run down and, and it, it rained all the time and it was just miserable apparently. But she produced this really quite remarkable series of works. And in, you know, one thing that I remember struck me at the time was just this sort of notion that, you know, you, you get lemons, you make lemonade, which is what she did. But the other thing that's interesting and maybe, yeah, yeah, let's, there's a couple more slides, I think mm -hmm. we can look at a couple more slides from this series, that it, it was really, um, these are some of the drawings and there were paintings as well, but she sort of, so there was this like pool, you know, this, this reflecting pool and this little cherub boy peeing into it. And, and one of the things that the work did, it was again, you know, taking off of the ideas of Rhapsody, but sort of this sort of inventory of, of different ways of looking at things. And, and again, to make a, a, a cinematic reference like Rashomon, all of these different views of this same, um, you know, actually in this case, very, again, very banal um, setting. And yet she, she, she examined it from all of these different sides and, and, and she also used all these different stylistic um, methods. And, and so it was, it became again, a further exploration, I think of her, um, you know, the, the way that she, she was really dissecting what art is, how art operates. And I know Klaus, you've written about this series. Maybe you wanna say a few other things. Yeah, so first off, um, you know, she, uh, she traded uh, houses with uh, a, a friend of hers, a British writer, Piers Paul Reed. I don't really know who he is. Uh, and, uh, um, and she created this series. She created about 200 works on paper uh, in that uh, villa. And uh, yes, it was, she hated it. Uh, the weather was horrible. Uh, she probably was depressed. Uh, but nevertheless, she, you know, she went through the motions and she did again, uh, trying out different styles through, through art history and different ways uh, of, of, of uh, watercolors and, and pastel and black and white uh, charcoal and, uh, and, and so on. And uh, then um, she came back to, to New York and she continued working on the series. So, uh, you know, by then, I guess she realized that, the, that this was you know, an important um, series that she created there. And then she made larger work. She made um, canvases, uh, paintings. Uh, she painted on glass. She painted on, on, you know, on the signature enamel plates. And, uh, and it became you know, th this very, very uh, important uh, exhibition. Um, and what uh, what attracted me to this was, of course, she also, as many of you know, was was an, a, a brilliant horticulturalist. She she was a gardener. She she created gardens wherever she lived. She had an amazing garden in uh, on Charles Street in in the village. She created another garden in Brooklyn. She had you know this amazing um, garden and wildlife kind of reserve in Amagansett. So uh, she. Uh, that was very important, and, and that's where I suddenly got very interested because uh, Pierre Bernard was also a, an avid gardener, and he 
uh, his work was so much about uh, the inside and the outside, mostly looking out from the inside to his garden. And, uh, and a lot of the same kind of dialectic goes on in, in Jennifer's work. So, so um, sadly, we had to cancel the exhibition because of COVID, but I'm hoping that we can still find uh, a time to, to do it again. <clears throat> but uh, uh, it's, I think it is, it is really her second most important work after Rhapsody. Yeah. Uh, I uh, think that, oh, sorry. Ahead, yeah. I, was say, I was just looking at the date of the year of In the Garden, 1980, mm -hmm. and thinking about how, uh, what was Bartlett's role and influence on the reemergence of painting in the late 70s and early 80s, and specifically uh, figurative um, neo-expressionist painting. And, and in many ways, I can I look at um, her work and uh, with Rhapsody and uh, Elizabeth Murray as uh, painters, two painters who who were totally committed to painting at a time when famously it was it was not uh, it was not seen as a really a kind of viable, interesting area to work in. And in some ways, they sort of got the ball rolling, and then there was this kind of wave of um, painters from from Europe and from the States who were getting a lot of attention. Male painters. Yes, male, I was going to say exactly. we can bring in the male, gender issue here. Yeah, yes. Yeah, male painters. So, um, and I don't think uh, you could you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't really think that um, Bartlett was ever contextualized within neo-expressionism. Uh, and, and I mean, there are obvious reasons why that might be. And she's, you know, she's not a neo-expressionist. She's like, you know, she is, and she's also 20, 30, 50 different other things. Um, so I think that's something to, to, to think about looking at this work that like, and she, you know, I, from, I have never met her, uh, so I've written about her work and looked at it a lot. Um, I know from reading interviews with her is that she's she seemed very aware of what other people, other artists were doing, especially when in, in the beginning. And she, you know, I think she she was always, always has been challenging herself to to make something great. And as Klaus said, you know, at the risk of failure, at you know, trying things that that maybe you're not going to work out. And I mean, for me, that's always the more interesting kind of artist, someone who's who, who does, who's working with the unknowns, with uh, the unpredictables. Um, but yeah, I think she, you know, the, some of this history still needs to be rewritten and revised. I like yeah, and I think, yeah, to just to bring in the, the gender thing a little bit more, um, I mean, it's interesting that she and Elizabeth Murray, I mean, both of them were pioneers here in, you know, kind of bringing, you know, the sort of this, you know, reintroducing a kind of figurative abstraction or, you know, this, this merger of figurative figuration and abstraction, but because they both were dealing with sort of what was perceived as more, I guess you would say domestic and therefore feminine, mm -hmm. you know, kinds of, of themes, I, that may be one of the reasons why they, you know, in, in the 80s with the explosion of, of neo-expressionist paintings, they weren't really getting their due because it was, you know, that, that kind of imagery, you know, was, was sort of devalued next to the heroic um, kinds of, of themes that, you know, the, you know, the more exalted, the, the, the more, um, you know, famous artists of the time were doing. And you know, uh, I'd like to add- yeah. Yes, Fong, yes. Yeah, it's so interesting hearing all you just say. Uh, I remember in my interview with Elizabeth Murray, as well as um, Jennifer, you know, there's very important to put them in contact. Again, you know, they, they went to the same college in Mill College in Florida, I mean, in, in California. And then one went on to Yale for graduate school the other one went to Chicago Art Institute. And it's interesting to put them in that period in graduate school, undergrad and graduate school, decisively who were interested mm -hmm. in other painter. You know, I think they will talk, they talk about that to me. Um, that's one of the joy that, 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 that you, when one does, you know, undertake 
this interview, in-depth interview, you get the whole narrative, the formation of the mm. world. Yeah. And for, 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 for Jennifer, it was Gorky, Asha Gorky. It's very interesting because Gorky to us is somebody who associates somewhere between surrealism and beginning of abstract expressionism. You know, and he himself had gone on, you gone through a period of so-called self-imposed uh, apprenticeship. Remember, he was famously once say, I was uh, with Cezanne for a long time. Now I'm natural with Picasso, you know? And, but for, uh, for Elizabeth, it was the Kunin. So they both taken on heroic male abstract expressionist painter. For Elizabeth was the Kunin. And for her, it was particularly the painting that she studied almost every day, you know, uh, at the Art Institute of Chicago, which is the Kuhn in 1950, the biggest painting ever painted, excavation. Mm -hmm. So that to me is so interesting they would talk about that. Um, but I think it's also there's a, 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 a dimension of pol po political implication here, Eleanor, you mm -hmm. know? When you think about what Raphael was saying in the 70s, you know, I think this was made, uh, Rhapsody, there's a note on, on Rhapsody again, it was made um, the tail end when the Vietnam War ended. You know, you go back and you look at it, the date. I think that is so interesting. And I'm thinking about also how uh, another I would say masterpiece that anyone have made, you know, um, whether during that period or a little bit earlier, maybe the tail end of the late sixties. I think of Rhapsody in the same way I think of Joe Zucker, uh, 100 foot long piece that was made in the height of the Vietnam war, you know, and that's for material selection that he about to decisively to undertake individually for different phase in his work throughout. So that's another question about form and materials that we can talk about, but I just want to make sure that I get that um, yes. in yeah. terms of the, you know, right. contextualizing the male painter that they both uh, admire yeah. so much, the Kunin Gorky. Right. Well, I, we have a lot of other slides to go through, so we're going to move, yeah. move forward again now. Um, and so let's see what's next. Ah, the hospital series. Oh. Now, now this is something, I, Raphael, that you have written about. So maybe you'd want to address this. Um, sure, I'll say a few words about it. Uh, it's a, um, there are two bodies of work. Uh, one are uh, oil and canvas, uh, 54 square inch paintings, and the other uh, a related um, body of uh, pastels. So each of, the uh, each of the paintings in this series. Um, if you could just go to the next one as well, um, so we can. Uh, each one has um, is a view either uh, uh, an exterior view from a hospital, uh, we assume, or an interior view of a hospital. Um, and every painting has the word hospital written on it in these sort of very plain. Uh, block letters, and it has a line going from one edge to another, a colored line. So these are, um, you know, they the. It's not explicitly autobiographical, but we can assume uh, if we look at the view uh, where the hospital is on the East River. Um, these are also the, you know, the their marvelous, great um, uh, paintings of New York City, and I think there's. Uh, there's a there's a painting by George O'Keefe in the 19 mid 20s of the East River, which has some of the same uh, details as uh, as Bartlett's paintings. Um, and uh, and so I think like they're interesting and important paintings just in the history of depicting New York City, but they're also um, have this. I think they're sort of about painting, but also about kind of uh, about experience in a way. So. Um, what is the you know what is the content and subject of this painting and and it seems to say I mean one of the ways I think about this is that it's it's saying like when one is in the hospital the whole world is seen through that um, perspective like you can't you know if you look out the window if you are reading a book if you're talking to someone you're you're you know whatever 
whatever is in front of you is is seen through the the grid or through the perspective or the situation of, of being in the hospital mm -hmm. and so um and yet uh so i think that like it's that contingency that these paintings are saying and i think they're also what they're saying is that you know i think whenever we're looking at something whether it's a painting or 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 across you know across the room what we think what we're thinking is not necessarily it's what we're looking at there's this sort of you know layering complexity contradictions in consciousness there's a sort of phenomenological aspect to these paintings so they're about like being a patient being hospital being ill and yet the seemingly the last thing she does in each of these paintings is paint this line could you go back to the previous one please thanks so um, is to paint a line. And for me, the line is one, it's it's saying, here is abstraction. I'm introducing abstraction into this painting, into this figurative painting. But it's also saying, I think, I'm asserting my freedom as an artist. I'm asserting my freedom as a person, as an individual. I am not defined by my illness. I am not defined by the institution I'm part of. And that, you know, the and, and also somewhere Bartlett says, she says, I've never seen a sad abstract painting. I've never seen a sad figurative painting. For me, painting is cheerful. And I think these are like, I mean, these are, you know, they're they're facing mortality, but they're also, you know, celebrations, not to be too cliched about, they're celebrations of painting. And this painting, and there are a couple of others of these corridors, reminds me so much of Van Gogh's. Uh, very, you know, the almost the last paintings he made when he was in the asylum in uh, Saint Paul, and uh, so there's this like to me the 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 complexity and the sense of storytelling and narrative, but also the the sense of like putting everything at risk uh, in the pursuit of great painting is like encapsulated in this work for me. So there is another uh, body of work that she did uh, in her while she was in 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 the hospital uh, a few years earlier in 2005 2006. Um, they are the the word paintings. They're they're plate paintings. They also re uh, relate to the hospital, to the corridors, and all that stuff. And uh, and she basically created them. Do we, do we have an image of those? I don't know. Uh, created those um, writing, maybe not. Um, she did all the writing. Uh, they all consist of a lot of writing that she did, uh, and the writing is is on each of, of the plates. and uh, And the writing was done in the hospital, and the paintings were done after after she came out of the hospital. Yeah. So let, let's move now on to the next mm -hmm. the next set of slides, um, and these are are from the current show at Paula Cooper. The works themselves date, I guess, uh, they're back in, in the early 2000s. Um, and, and they are um, works that, that relate to kind of issues of mapping um, and place. And so Klaus, you know, you were talking about the importance of place and maybe we could kind of go through them somewhat quickly and we could stop, pause where we wish to. But uh, Klaus, I'd love to have you kind of address these in terms of how do you see them fitting in with the larger body of work and 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 this particular theme? Well, this this yeah, th these here are, are not really maps. They're uh, they're, they're they relate to systems, uh, and go kind of back to her her really early plate paintings. If you go further uh, to the actual maps that are in the show, like this one uh, from Mozambique, so then she did create a, a whole series of of maps. And to me, they you know they kind of combine her her lifelong interest in in systems and mathematics uh, with uh, with the that kind of focus on place. And um, you know, obviously, you know, there's there's mapping happening in uh, you know in Rhapsody in in all of her work in in a way. Um, and so, but these are geographical maps, uh, but they're um, abstracted and. Uh, and I think there, you know, there are about that kind of universal idea, of bringing the the idea of the place uh, up uh, onto a, a larger, much larger um, scale. 
Now, I, I, from what I understand, these are maps of places she had not been. Is that correct? By and large. So it wasn't that she, these weren't personal, you know, memories so much. I mean, that sort of deliberately, from what I understand, that sort of deliberately the maps yeah. were things that she she hadn't experienced because she had that not, level of abstraction. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure they're all places she has not been to, but I think, but they're definitely not about places she has been to, no. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Raphael, I don't know if you want to kind yeah. of uh, in here. Well, so mapping, I, mapping has attracted so many painters in the, like the last, uh, since uh, the post-war period, and I, you know, think about Jasper John's painting of uh, the U.S. I think about uh, Alighiero e Boetti. Um, I think about Guillermo Cuica, who painted starting in the early 90s, a, a lot of maps. And uh, like Bartlett, often of places he had never been, and he was, you know, not interested in the, in the autobiographical um, aspect of paintings, but, uh, of maps, but more the, the kind of metaphorical. But I think that, um, you know, what is it that, uh, and you know, there, there are many, many more, uh, Miguel Angel Rios is another artist who's used maps. So what is the, um, what is the attraction or why do, why, you know, why has Bartlett turned to maps and, and how does that fit in with the rest of her work? And uh, so I'm just looking at the, in some of these, um, where there are lines that cross the roads or um, some sort of, uh, some sort of trace. It's like the, and they, they remind me, they, they seem to look forward to the lines I was talking about in the hospital paintings, these things that cross. And I think that maybe the, I mean, I don't want to, you know, again, this is a question of like, what is the content? What is the subject? Like, what if we look at these not as being about geography, but really being, uh, a sort of exercise in in drawing in lines and finding pathways and i think that like maybe that's one of the motivating qualities in uh in bartlett's work is this like i mean as klaus says it's it's about place but it's also like places it's not just being in the place it's trying to find the place and uh and there's a restlessness in her work and maybe this this restlessness the stylistic restlessness, the formal restlessness is, is something that is, we can see kind of in the, in these um, paintings of maps as well. Yeah. And, uh, and they are, you know, they are, they are almost three-dimensional. They're not plate paintings, not, they are, uh, and they are shaped, you know, many of them are shaped in very interesting ways and uh, cropped, uh, the maps are cropped in very particular ways. Uh, so they, they almost become, well, they are objects more than paintings in a way. Yeah. You know, they make me looking at them here. I'm thinking a little bit about Julie Maritou's current show mm -hmm. at, the, at the Whitney also, you know, which is about that sort of layering and, and the references to these, these places. And they have, they, they almost feel like they sort of anticipate, you know, some mm -hmm. of the ways in which, you know, Maritou has been organizing a sense of reality. And, and, and also it's important to, to add the fact that uh, Matt, Matt, you mentioned Jasper Johns and Moetti, and I would even throw in Mark Lombardi and others, but Julie Meritu is also a very interesting case, Eleanor, because she, she deploys the kind of layering of transparency of different mapping and architectural system. And ultimately, I think they all have to do with the theme of conflicts, the theme of migration or identity or cultural political networks. And I think that these are so interesting, not only they are shaped, but they also display um, very irregularly on the war, mm -hmm. men in the whole entire war as part of the whole spatial experience. So the negative space between mm -hmm. them, I think count a great deal for how they create that dialogue to us as a viewers. And also, I, I'm just thinking about Elizabeth Murray looking at these paintings. I mean, I really, 
wonder, you know, they were very close. That must, there must have been some interesting back and forth in using canvases at that time. And especially the late Elizabeth Murray too, you know, Raphael. Yeah. No. Yeah. Now, have we gone through all of the shows, the the, the images from uh, the current show here? There's a few others here. Yeah, let's let's go through the, the slides. We're, I think getting to the point now for the, um, where we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, and I don't know if, if any of you have anything else that you want to add as we look, you know, again at the, the last of these slides. Yeah. Or... I'd like to make this comment, this following comment, just because when I was standing uh, in front of this painting just last Saturday, I don't know, I, I, I remember how she spoke of her experience at Yale, you know, she took on classes on color, theory of color taught by um, one of, both of them was student of, of Albert. Uh, Richard Sarah was one of the teacher. The other one is, I believe, Sai Silman. That was his name, who later published uh, the Albert famous book, Interaction of Color. And I think color is something that part of her um, essential mm -hmm. uh, formal element, just as much as form and repetition of the grid and whatnot. I think the way that she um, deployed colors are both, to me, theory driven and also practice combined, just like so many misunderstanding of, of Albert's teaching of color, like the way that we were taught to have this strong division between you know, Newtonian, Newtonian idea of color as opposed to Goethe idea of color. So one is completely scientific, the other one is emotional. Mm. I think that Jennifer's case is able to do both. And I think that's very unique. I don't know, what do you think about that, Klaus and Raphael? Well, you know, she, she started out with Rhapsody, she limited herself to six colors only. So it was all very, very uh, systematic again. Uh, and then only slowly moved up. But um, uh, yes, I think color is, is, is enormously important in, in her work. Um, I think one thing we, we would be interesting to talk about, um, I just thought of it when Julie Meritu was mentioned, is kind of the, the influence that, that Jennifer had on, on younger artists, which I think is, is not really talked about much. I, I think that um, she really was, uh, you know, she she really broke a lot of uh, ground for for a younger generation, especially of women artists. Yeah, women painters, especially. Right. Yeah, and and you know, again, sort of um, the, the the sort of mix of figurative and and um, abstraction, you know, conceptual and experiential, I think is something that you see in a lot of younger artists and particularly younger women artists as well. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if, if you know, um, Fong or Raphael, if you, you know, want to kind of weigh in on, you know, what, what, what are, what is the influence? Clearly, you know, I mean, uh, there, there's a lot of, um, her, you know, I mean, just from the fact that we have all these participants in this um, panel, you know, that there's a great deal of interest in her work. Um, but do you see, could you, what do you see tracing that influence? Um, I don't know about, I mean, I, there, that seems likely implausible. I don't, can't call up uh, immediately any examples of her influence, but I think it's certainly worth pursuing. But I think that another way to approach this is that her work, like why the, there's something about her work that appeals to us, to artists, and to viewers, to the audience right now, like what is it about the work? And maybe it is, it's, it's that, you know, maybe Julie Maritou's work, you know, is, is, is making us rethink and revise our sense of history. And so that an artist like Jennifer Bartlett rises to the surface and becomes more central because that's, because her work corresponds to, mm -hmm corresponds more closely to, to where we are now. And so it's it's almost a, you know, it's it's almost as if the younger artists are influencing not her work, but how we see her work. Mm. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah and uh, I would also uh, 
like to add that um, we did manage, we did try to in, invite Julie Meritu and um, Laura Owens uh, to mm. join the panel, but they are um, they couldn't given the date they couldn't join us. But definitely, you're absolutely right. I like to also um, add another thing about what Jennifer wants to talk, how John Cage influence on her work. I think that's a very important thing to bring in the, the idea of random elements that occur in the grid or the plate, you know? I think, I think that change operation around 68, 69 was essential uh, to that formation of that, the work that followed in the decade of the 70s, leading to Rhapsody. Um, but yeah, we, we can go further a bit later, maybe. Uh, yeah. I'd like to just address one of the questions that was addressed to me, actually. Um, why is uh, Jennifer not better known in Europe? Um, I think it's an excellent question. I think it's it's true for both Jennifer and uh, Elizabeth Murray. They, they both really do not have the kind of recognition um, one would expect them to have in Europe. They both have complained about that, uh, that they're not getting enough shows in Europe and so forth. I um, I still experience it not even a, a year or year, two years ago when I tried. I really wanted to have a, a, a you know a French museum to show uh, the the Bernard Bartlett show. I could not find uh, do it. Um, the it it's I'm not a hundred percent sure what what the answer is. I think there is something very American about both of these artists' work that translates uh, that might be difficult to translate into uh, in, into uh, European ideas but but of course there are other artists that are very American and they're extremely successful in Europe so that may not really work either I don't really have an answer for it but it is true uh, it is true that um, that uh, you know these artists and, and when you think about Jennifer especially with with all the uh, she's lived in France and with all the work that she's done there, um, that she is not not better known there is is a, is really a, a puzzles me. I, I don't really have an answer for that. I wonder. I can't help wondering whether gender has anything to do with that. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, both in Germany and in France. And uh, although although Elizabeth uh, did manage, you know, to be included in in Robert Stewart. Uh, 2007 Venice Biennale, she actually flew over to participate uh, of her inclusion. So I think that was kind of beginning, but you're absolutely right with the gender uh, have a lot to do with it. And the other thing is what you say there also Klaus makes sense. The, the, the strong association with a certain aesthetic that is so strongly adhere to a certain Americanness, you know? That's not to say, if you take two male painter, actually, uh, we are about to welcome another program on our NSE, I think in a, in a week or 10 days, of Albert Pinkham Ryder, who's now subject of a big show uh, of his hometown in Bedford, Massachusetts, where he was born at the Welland Museum, because they couldn't find a venue in, in elsewhere really since 1989, I think, when wow. it was Brooklyn Museum. But what, why is it that Pollock became world famous, appreciated mm. in Europe, why writer to whom he admires so much is not? So I think there's something to be, uh, we need to think about that a little bit more. We need to meditate on that front a little bit also. I more. think we have to thank the American government for for Pollock's success in Europe, you know, as you know. <laughs> you mean CIA funded? Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I, I had a, another thought about the um, about why Bartlett and uh, Murray haven't received the same kind of attention in Europe uh, as other artists of their generation or, or younger or older. And uh, thinking about that, I suddenly thought like, they the the whole the kind of theoretical discourse of um about uh art about um you know and which was for a long time and i guess still is kind of anti-painting or or only accepts certain like sort of um you know accepts a, a a quota of painters into 
the critical theoretical um, kind of for shorthand, the October version of, um, mm -hmm. of post-war art. And I think that, uh, you know, there's certainly plenty of material, plenty of meat for theory in theoretical ideas and discourse in both artists' work. But I think maybe that might also be uh, a factor is that there is not, you know, they don't come their work and, and maybe it resists it, I don't know, but it doesn't come with this kind of nice theoretical packaging to it. It's, uh, it is what it is. It's very, it's like, it's visceral. It's, um, it's individual, it's, uh, it's direct and um, uh, not at all naive by any means, but um, maybe that, maybe somehow that it, it's, it's exclusion from uh, theoretical based versions of recent art history may have an effect on its um, yeah, I, mean, I, I, would, I would also add Raphael, Klaus, and, and Eleanor, just to continue early on when I brought up the, the issue of being political. I think that both Elizabeth Murray and Jennifer Bartlett are equally invested in the, that amazing immersive freedom, refuse to be pigeonholed in any category. I think the other important thing that, that is to say that the, there's certain narrative with the, the steel light interior, you know, what you mentioned about in Elizabeth's work earlier, Eleanor, or in Jennifer with nature and whatnot, you know, the space, the place that she inhabit is, the, is, the, is the, the total commitment to tell narrative. There's a story to be told here, you know, whether it told many different perspectives, different ways uh, going about that kind of sharing narrative uh, from one to the next, uh, or as unfold, I, 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 I can't help but to think of joys because it go further back when they, they met in college at Mills undergrad, you know, when Elizabeth was reading joys, I can't help but think of joys, uh, one of the most important thing he said that um, the supreme question about work of art is how is out of how, is out how deep a life does it spring? How, how you live it in a way. And, and Tony Morrison say the same thing. She say the first sentence of our childhood that we all remember is the phrase one upon the time. And I think that is super important this narrative because the left doesn't have a narrative at the moment. <laughs> they always go to say it to the right. Uh, we have facts, but facts, it's not a factor. You can go to the internet and Google for facts if you want. You know, so I believe that the, the retrieving or some kind of attempt to offer some form of narrative is so essential today with the, the way that you mentioned Julie Maratu. I mean, she does it with abstraction and transparency, but there's a strong narrative element there the right to opacity, you know? And I think this, the right to opacity is applied here too. This show is amazing because you can't really put your head around, look at it one or two painting. You have to really emerge in the whole totality of the viewing experience, which I have, I have to say, it probably requires several viewing experiences in order to feel close with each of the work in there. Like I say, I, it's a really in, it's an immersive installation no more, no less than Rhapsody in some way. Well, I think um, that's a good segue. Let's let's move now into um, questions from the audience. And um, I think what, Jess, you're you going to read them? Yes. So our first question comes from Kevin Wilder. Uh, I am reading on Kevin's behalf. He wanted to know, can you please talk about Jennifer Bartlett's process making the steel plates of Rhapsody? Um, that sounds like a question for Klaus. Yes, uh, okay. So it, um, it was a very complicated process. Um, uh, she, uh, she had the, the plates fabricated in a particular place um, and they are enameled, all the paint is enameled, uh, aluminum and uh, steel. And then there, and then she, you know, she has a, a grid 
uh, and over time she she varied the the number of uh, well it it has uh, she she varied the number of um, spaces within the grids and then she you know she uses the dots to paint them and she only used uh, six colors originally uh, to paint them and uh, uh, and and created a you know really a system that way and then she kind of started to loosen that system slowly a little bit. Uh, so there were 12 inch square steel plates. Uh, she had, uh, she were inspired by the New York City subway signs uh, and uh, were made by uh, Gerson Feiner in his family's custom metal fabrication shop in New Jersey. 16 gauge cold rolled steel uh, measuring one foot square and they were covered with an appliance white baked enamel, enamel surface. And there's a small hole in each corner with which to fix the plate to the, uh, to the wall. Uh, and they're silk screened and epoxied with a light gray grid that mimics the graph paper that Jennifer used uh, in, in his very early um, works. Uh, the original silk screening was done by Joe Watanabe, who was an assistant to um, Solo it, uh, and uh, and and I think that she she got the idea some of the idea of that from Holy Naj, uh, his famous uh, telephone pictures. There were enamel, um, there were also enamel paintings that were done kind of remotely by um, according to his uh, instructions by people in in a paint factory. So. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much the process. All right, thank you. Um, do we have another question? Yeah, we have a couple more. Thank you, Klaus. We have a lot of young artists on the NSC, so it's always nice to have a process question in the mix. Next up, we have Rachel Duplessis. Rachel, you should be able to unmute. Hi, my question from a poet, actually, is um, a result of a productive mishearing about something that Rachel said, which was when he said diachronic, or when he said diagrammatic, I heard diachronic. Now, it really is a productive mishearing, so I'd like to pursue it for just a second, because diachronic, which um, leads to the question, the synchronic, the opposite or the related, um, Whereas diagrammatic is a chart, a graph, um, something marked out, which evokes conceptual art much more than synchronic, diachronic as a pair, which have to do with time. And uh, because my knowledge of Bartlett is limited to Locke's Gallery in Philly, which is where I live, I got very interested in the notion of surreality in her art and, or the series, but surreality is a term very common in poetry, which has to do with vectors of thinking that shift or change um, as the poem goes on, which reminds me of Hospital and the, um, the corresponding poems by Wiston Kerno in mm. the, I guess in the pastel version. So um, I wanted to know how people would think about the productive mishearing between diagrammatic and diachronic in Bartlett's work, particularly uh, Raphael, but anybody else, considering the notion of catalog inventory and so on that is so um, important and so central to her art. Yeah, Raphael. Uh, yeah, um, uh, I think that, I think diachronic is maybe even more um, uh, more useful term to uh, think about to use uh, apply to um, Bartlett's paintings um, and I and thinking about like as you said series of poems and and in some ways like how we look at her paintings um, certainly how we look you know how do we look at uh, a painting like Rhapsody, and it's almost like we're we're reading it. We're like we're scanning. We're going from, you know, and and we can think of the as those uh, panels, the um, 
each plate as a, as a sort of page or the limits of the page. I think that, um, but I don't know. I, I you know there there are you know here's an artist who has there's an openness to her work and uh, and as Klaus's title of the show uh, the exhibition he curated says a kind of universality like a you know an immense scope that that there is there are so many places there's so many jumping off points um, but just to uh, Rachel to to address the difference between diachronic and, and diagrammatic. I mean, for me, the, diagr I, the, the diagrammatic aspect of her painting, which is not limited to the maps, is I think she is trying to find some way that is neither uh, exclusively figurative or exclusively abstract. Mm -hmm. And right. I think that's where the diagram, like that's, for me, that's that's why I think of them as diagrammatic, but certainly I think the experience of them is, is more, compared to many other painters is more uh, diachronic than, than synchronic. Yeah, I have to add also following your question, Rachel, that when, um, Elis I think when uh, Jennifer came to New York in 1967, just refer what Klaus just say about um, solo with uh, assistant, you know, just a side note, it was Joe Shapiro who paid she lent her $500, I think, for the first payment of, uh, of the play, uh, which he, she, I think she paid back later. But the point was in 67, it was a very decisive year because it was the year that, that, that solo with um, famous, uh, paragraph on conceptual art was published in Art Forum. Oh, okay. To, to, I remember correctly, clearly in my interview with Jennifer, she say, she referred to it as one of the greatest late 20th century poems. So, you know, we had to think in that, that construct of how she read it, probably different than anyone else who did, you know? Um, but, uh, but so I, I would have, and there with, with that reference. I think we have time just maybe for one or two more questions. So um, Jess, anything else that you would like to bring forward? Yeah, so thank you, Rachel, for your question. Uh, our next question comes from Lynn Crawford. Lynn, uh, you should be able to unmute. Thank you, this is wonderful. Um, Raphael, I was so interested when you talked about um, Jennifer Bartlett's work as a celebration of painting, which sounds like such a simple, it's just a few words, but it's such a rich topic. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little more about that. Uh, okay, uh, Lynn, I, I actually was expecting you to ask me about Raymond Cano. Well, I was. And, <laughs> and style so because, talk about the you know, <laughs> because your own writing is so, I mean, your use of constraint uh, and system well, okay. is in, in some ways I see like real affinities between uh, how you approach uh, the, the materiality of language and, and narrative and, uh, and Jennifer Bartlett's um, uh, work like Rhapsody. So, but anyway, um, the... No. The celebration of, anyway. Anytime. <laughs> okay. But the celebration of painting? Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, no, you can answer the, you could talk about Ramon Cano. Uh, um, well, let's, you know, the celebration, like the, she, she loves giving herself constraints, I think, in, in her work, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, I think in the, uh, in Rhapsody in the early uh, plate paintings, she was only working with the colors that were produced by a particular paint manufacturer. She didn't, you know, she, and that was almost you know, intentionally limiting herself to just six colors. So that's, that's a kind of constraint. Um, and, uh, and, and, or like painting the same pool in the South of France hundreds of times. And, but within that, and this is, I guess, the great lesson of Ulipo and, and constrictive writing is within those constraints, you find freedom and you find, and, and, and maybe that is a kind of celebration of, of painting or celebration of the language of painting. 
Thank you. What, well, let's do one more question. All right. Our last question comes from Leah Singer. Leah, you should be able to unmute. I'll keep it short. I think we would all agree that Jennifer Bartlett is radical. Um, where she, you know, builds systems and then she blows them all apart. So I just wanted to ask the speakers about her ambiguous relationship to the grid. Thank you. I can undertake that. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, her relationship to film, we haven't really dealt with at all, Eleanor. I mean, for once, you know, she had a very close relationship with Walker Schondorf, you know, the, the, the film, German film director who made Tin Drum and Swan in Love and many. And having also married to an actor also, Mathieu Carrier, who I know very well, partly because one of the great films that changed my life uh, was uh, Tony Kroger, based on Thomas Mann's novella. And we talk about that too, that's 1962. I mean, that to me is like as important as a novel and film uh, as the, you know, Joy's portrait of a, uh, of a young artist and a young man, really. You know, it, it's a, the, the odyssey that undertaken can be recontextualized, the epic ambition that he felt for Homer, Ulysses, you know. But to, 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 to answer your question, Leah, I think what, to me, that how I observe closely looking at it and having the privilege to interview both of them in greater depth. You know, you have to remember about the real interview, even though it's in that meaning we purpose between five to 7,000 words, it really reduced and added down from 30,000 plus words. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of things to be contemplating, and think it over. In other words, about both of them, and certainly now with uh, Jennifer. To me, the radicality have to do, to, to, it builds around constant alertness, a certain kind of self-awareness and self-criticality uh, that lead to creating that one space in the art world, you know, Eleanor, where the male dominated art world in certain decade and it moved to certain ways from local in America to now internationally across the globe, but I believe that's what we just recently published, Michael Snow, you know, uh, with Raymond Foy, great in-depth um, interview with, with, with Michael, and he say, to create something new, one must break some rules, uh, but those rules must be also be super familiar or worth breaking. And I think that's where the radicality based on, if that answered your question, in other words, um, it's like, I think the Kunin say it best, and I always say this to young artists today, when I was teaching, to create a style beforehand is the mere apology of your own anxiety, you know? So I think that Elizabeth Murray and Jennifer Bartlett share that immense, radical, epic ambition. They're more ambitious than you think, you know? And I'm, I'm dying to see Another show, maybe the four of us can carry it together, Klaus, if you don't mind, share the credits. <laughs> but um, anyway, I, I feel that there's so much to be unfold about her work. And I would definitely recommend those of you who are here to see it and mo multitude of time because they're very rich and complex. Back to you, Jess. Thanks. That, that is a great place to, to end this um, discussion, I think. Thank you, Fang. And, and thank you, Raphael. And uh, thank you, Klaus. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, everyone. And now I think we move on to the um, literary moment here. That's exactly right. Thank you all. This has been such a capacious and rich and generous conversation. Mm -hmm. So as Eleanor mentioned at the rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And I am thrilled to welcome Malva Kajali to the stage. She'll read a poem by Fez Ahmad Fez. Fez Ahmad, Ahmad Fez was an influential left-wing intellectual and revolutionary poet from Pakistan who wrote in the Urdu language. He published eight books of poetry, some of which have been translated into English and Russian. Fez was the first Asian poet to win the, the Lenin Peace Prize, and in 1984, he was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. Malvika, take it away. 
thank you so much, Jess. Um, and thank you everyone for this conversation. Uh, it's been so fascinating, willow tree and all. Um, uh, I feel that we often call Fez Ahmed Fez a Pakistani poet, um, but in truth, he is one among a generation of poets who can neither be called Indian or Pakistani, uh, who share an experience of belonging to a nation that has ceased to exist. Um, so this poem I'm going to read for you today uh, he wrote in the early 80s while in exile in Beirut as he witnessed the Sabra and Shatila massacres in Lebanon. Um, so the title of the poem is Palestini Shahidun Jo Pardes Mekam Ai. Shahid is a word that in Urdu and Farsi has a variety of meanings but means beloved, sweetheart, and I'll add poet. And in Arabic, uh, the same word becomes witnessed and then martyr. So the title of the poem translates as Palestinian Shahids who proved useful in foreign lands. Um, and I'm giving this note uh, because uh, the title of this poem is usually not included in translations because of the complications that hinge on this word, uh, Shahid. Um, but I, you know, I think it's important to include and to maybe meditate together, especially in wake of the widespread arrests of young children, teenagers, and journalists, um, especially those like Muna and Mohammed El Khord, who, uh, you know, were really responsible for broadcasting the atrocities unfolding in Sheikh Jarrah on social media. Um, I think in the wake of those events, it's really important that, that we consider the questions that Fez's title uh, poses, um, which I would say are, you know, what does it mean to prove useful in foreign lands as a poet, as a beloved, as a witness, and as a martyr? Uh, so I'll read it first as it is in Urdu and then in English in my own translation. Uh, and thank you so much for listening. And here's a little text if you want to follow along. Palestini Shahido Jopardes Mekam Ai. Mejahan per bigea arzivetan, teri tazlil ki dago ki jalandil melie, teri hurmat ki chirago ki lagandil melie. Teri ulfat, teri yado ki kasak saath gayi. Teri naran shagufo ki mehek saath gayi. Sare an dekhe rafiko ki jalo saath raha. Kitne haato se ham agosh mere haath raha. Dur per des ki be meher guzar gaho me. Ajnabi sher ki be namo ne shan raho me. Jis se min per bhi khila mere lahu ka percham. Leh lahata hai vaha, arz e filistin ka alam. Tere ada ne kiya ek filistin barbad. Mere zakhmo ne kiye kitne filistin abad. Um, so in English, uh, I've done it as Palestinian beloveds who came of use in foreign lands. Wherever I have gone across the spans of my homeland, I have carried in my heart the burning of the scars of your disgracement. In my heart, I have also carried the hope of all the lamps lit in your name. Your kindnesses, your friends, your memories, their pangs of longing came along with me too. The scents of your flowering citrus trees, they followed me as well. So many unseen friends who I have never met, they followed me, their company stayed with me. In how many hands over all that time did my hands stay intertwined? In the friendless highways of faraway foreign lands, on the nameless unmarked alleys of strange cities, on whichever earth has bloomed the flag of my blood, flows there still my homeland of Palestine's sorrowful flag. Your enemies have laid waste to one Palestine. How many Palestines have our wounds created? Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thank you very much. OK, so I think that we are now ready to say goodbye. And thank you all for, for um, coming and, and listening and, and participating. Um, and we will see you all soon. And I'm going to go now and find out about this tree that apparently just fell down in our yard. <laughs> all, right. all right. Thank you, Eleanor. Okay. Thank you so much, Malvika. That was a beautiful translation and reading. 
Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you, Fong. Thank you to everyone who tuned in today and for all of your amazing questions. Join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a radical poetry reading curated by Paolo Javier, featuring readings by our Zamora Lynn Mark, Shaheen Qureshi, Kiki Rivera, and Charles Val. You can now turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Very much. Bye. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thank you, Paul and Malika. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you. Thank you for that translation. Thanks, Raphael. Congratulations, Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful afternoon, Thank everyone. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your trees okay? Yeah. <laughs> I hope Thank so. you, friends. Frost. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Go see the show. It's beautiful. Hi, Andrew. Don't do that. Bye bye. How are you? Okay. And uh, yeah, let now we can uh, go have our delicious lunch. Bye. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Klaus, Raphael, again, Eleanor. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Bye, bye. you guys. Love and courage.